Hi, everybody. We're at Marine Data Solutions today, and we're talking about satellites. Uh, we have the pleasure of being joined by Michael Robilio, our satellite expert. Michael, how you doing? Doing very good, and you? I'm really well, thanks, and thanks for having us. So, Mike, um, the topic that we want to discuss today is satellites, and satellites aren't necessarily a new thing, but as you and I were discussing a little while ago, it's interesting to, to take a look at the way technology has changed in the marine industry. You know, we even referenced when we were talking a bit, uh, a bit ago about the period of time it took from seafarers first taking to the water to where we had any electronic communications whatsoever. I mean, the Phoenicians didn't have anything. And up until the 1940s or 1950s, we really had nothing in the pleasure boat market sp marketplace. And then in the 50s and 60s, we started to communicate with AM radio. Uh, we had CB radios. Um, those were our only communication devices until we got into VHF. And then um, as far as navigation was concerned, we started with Loran and Loran A. Um, Loran A evolved into Loran C, which was simply a receiver on your boat that calculated the time it took from the signal transmitting from a master station to wherever you were and counting that in milliseconds and telling you a number that you would transpose onto a map and say, this is where I am, or a chart. In the early 1980s, they started to put satellites up. And we got this product called the Magellan Satellite Navigation System. And it was Mac Daddy. We could go long distances. We could be way out of sight of land. We could be hundreds of miles offshore and still get a signal. But if I remember correctly, there were periods of time when we couldn't receive a signal for as much as four and a half hours because of the angle to, from the horizon to the satellite or from directly overhead to the satellite, giving us a certain azimuth that the satellite had to pass us at in order to receive the signal. So every 90 minutes, a satellite went by, and if you were within the band of reception, you'd get an idea where you were. And if not, you didn't know where you were. But it was better than dead reckoning. <laughs> it's better than nothing. That's yeah. exactly right. So we, at least we had that going for yeah, us, right? Yeah. But satellites evolved significantly since then from strictly a, uh, a navigation device to be communication. Walk us through a little bit of where we started with satellite communication on the boats and where we are today. Well, okay, so with communication, it started out with geostationary satellites. Okay. That, and I think they're about it's either three or six hundred miles up in the air and <clears throat> they're big and they're clunky and they're slow and they've been up there for a long time which means they won't be up there a whole lot longer yes and the biggest drawback in addition to in the beginning they were very slow the biggest drawback was the latency and latency i don't know if you've ever talked to anybody on a satellite phone i'm sure you have and it's really easy to talk on top of each other because there's such a long delay between when you stop talking and i start right. that it's really weird but that's how it started and we've come a long way since then uh, now there's new satellites up there like with viasat that are significantly night and day faster than the old style ones um, and we've also got the new starlink constellation with the low earth orbit satellites. Okay. So we started with um, the uh, satellites where we could communicate, we could talk, we could have telephone communications, and then we went to internet connectivity with some of the satellite systems, and now you said we've got the, uh, the new system that is giving you much, much better speeds than the old systems yes. gave, and now we have a new system called Starlink. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about what does Starlink do, how does it Get, how does it work together with other systems or is it completely standalone? How does all that work? Okay, so Starlink is standalone. It's okay. its own satellite constellation. Okay, how, all, many, how many satellites in the constellation? Right now there's about 4,000 of them up there. Wow. And it's projected to be as many as 30,000. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, so, so right now we're probably around, you know, a little bit over 10% of projected capacity. Okay. And there's already over a million users, so they, they are launching more satellites. It's about 50 satellites a week uh, is what's going up there. And they're moving constantly. So there's going to be times when there's just not one above for you to see because we got to launch 20,000 more. 
So there's so they're times not in fixed when orbit. They're actually they're, traveling yeah. around. They're orbiting the Earth. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Low Earth orbit. So the okay. so and the low Earth orbit is what gives them significantly better latency than what the older geostationary satellites had. So you don't have that half a second delay in a, in a conversation. Well, the signal travels at 186,000 miles per second. So it only stands to reason that if it's 600 miles up in the sky, it's gonna take a period of time to get there. Yes. If it's 200 miles up in the sky, it's gonna take one third the time to get there. Yes. So that would take care of your latency or what sounds, it was, feels like buffering almost. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Okay. For sure, okay. it's like a delay. Okay. And you can't get around it. Okay. Uh, one of those laws of physics things. Right. <laughs> we don't mess with those. Yeah, right. We, we just say, okay. Okay. Um, but the the new system, Starlink, is doing a lot. It's really revolutionizing everything. It's all, everything's changing now. Um, and it takes a great leap forward in speed and a great leap forward in being available in very remote locations. Okay. So... A lot of people cruise the Caribbean and the Bahamas, and there's a lot of places where there's just no 4G service. It just doesn't exist. There's no signal. There's no tower within 20 miles. Well, <clears throat> because of Starlink, all those places now have coverage. So it allows the people on the boats to go to far more remote locations where before there was no communication. And, you know, if the boss can't make his phone calls every morning to the right. business, then he can't be in that remote location. So this, this opens up a lot more... Uh, availability for owners to uh, and charter guests to use the boat in a location where they couldn't go before. Yeah, to travel at their leisure and go anywhere they want to go. Yeah. And the equipment is significantly smaller, lighter, yes. easier to install, uh, easier to hide on the boat. Yes. Uh, it's, if I'm not mistaken, when we get, to, we're going to talk about it in a minute where the signal go gets to, but it becomes wireless yes. in most applications. So while there is some hardwired infrastructure, it becomes a wireless product that allows anyone on the boat anywhere to connect and communicate, entertain, do whatever it is that they choose to do, just like a land-based, like you're used to having in your home in Fort Lauderdale or you know, Minnesota or your office. Or, or, or your office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Same thing. So what uh, Starlink does is it gives us this blanket or constellation <coughs> of satellites what other systems are we using to pull in? You said that not every place has 4G. Um, heck, not every place has 4G anymore because a lot of places now have 5G, yes, right? Yes. And despite the controversy about who who's 5G is and who builds it and who's getting the signal or whatever, it's it's what we're using today. Yes. So on the boats, if you're near shore, you're typically going to be using. 5G receptions? Yes, yes. Okay. When you get outside of the 5G area, what happens then? Well, so 5G is a very limited, it's a super high speed, but it's a very limited distance from the tower. Okay. So the next step down from 5G is the old 4G LTE. So that's, so if you're two miles from the tower, you're on LTE. Okay. Um, that's what we were looking at on my phone. Yes, a that's what, yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. And, and, um, but the maximum range from a tower with the correct antennas for, a, for an LTE or a 5G system is about 20 miles okay. with the right antennas and the, the antennas are over there. Um, but you're about 20 miles max. You know, and over in the Bahamas, I think there's a tower every 18 miles and you got about 20 miles max. So okay. it, unless you have the right antennas and everything, you, there's just going to be some spots where it just gaps. doesn't work. But you're going to go two miles over there and it's going to work. Okay. So when you roam out of the cellular range, then you're going to go to either the Viasat geostationary satellites or you're going to go to the Starlink satellites. Okay. And what we're finding is that when you blend all of that together, it really helps your reliability and your speeds. Okay. So we have to have different equipment to receive the 5G signal, to receive the, um, the high-speed satellite signals, and to receive the Starlink Yes. signals. So how do we, do we have to have all three of those in our device so that we can have it automatically switched? Do we have to have our device manually switched from, oh, I'm not getting much of a 5G signal. Let me go to the Viacom. Oh, no, wait a second. Uh, uh, how do we, how do we bring all of that together to have a seamless user experience? That, that's what our new product, the Blender, does. Okay. So it'll take 
Uh, it's made by KitchenAid, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's different made by Marine blender? Data. Yeah, okay. completely different uh, blender. All right. But we do get that a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and the reason we called it Blender was because it was really hard to explain what it did. Well, it sounds and, perfectly logical right, so that we, it blends the signals, right, correct? Right. Okay. So, not only does it blend them, but it also bonds them. And bonding is a, is a method where you're able to increase the speed. So, the Blender will take four inputs. So, when you say, okay, I want to download this picture, on a regular piece of equipment that's not bonded, well, the one network connection goes up to the internet, however it gets there and back, and there it is. Well, with the blender doing the bonding, it sends a little bit down each pipe. Well, one pipe is 5G, another pipe is Starlink, another pipe is Starlink, another pipe is Viasat. It sends a little bit of that signal across all of them, which not only blends it, makes it a little more secure, but it also speeds up how fast the reaction time of the whole system is. Okay. So the, the purpose of the blender is to not only speed it up and make it a little more um, secure, but it also makes it to be a seamless user experience. Okay. So you don't have to wonder what happened. It's just going to do its thing. So, so we've got the blender and some antennas and stuff yes. over here on the display board. Let's walk yes. over and take a look at okay. what what are we looking at? Where does the signal come in? So the signal is in the ether. It's up in the sky, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. And on the roof of the building here, we have a Starlink antenna. We have two. Yes. You have two Starlink. Two antennas. Starlink antennas. Do we have any other antennas outside, at, like on the up on the arch of the yacht? We we put those here. This okay. would be what's up on the hard top or the okay. arch. We put two of them in here okay. uh, for 5G. So we've got the two Starlink routers with two Starlink antennas on the building roof. And we've got our two 5G antennas with our two 5G PEP waves here. Okay. And each of those puts out its own internet signal, which goes to our blender. The, the blender then bonds and puts them all together, increases the speed, and then there's one wire out going to the boat's network. So it takes all of your sources and seamlessly puts them together. Puts them into one place. Puts them into one output. Provides it to the network. Yes. And then you do whatever you choose to do with it right. in the network. Yes. And we'll talk about that in another segment, about what do we do with the signal once it's received into the boat. So you made an interesting comment a moment ago, and that was about security. The big thing in this day and age, while we've become so accustomed to having a seamless electronic experience, uh, people are starting to understand and, and you know we have so many creative ways that people go after your signal, your information or whatever. Security is an important thing. Yes. Now, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole into a bunch of cybersecurity here, but what what does the blender do to provide you security? Well. Because it's dividing the signal across each of those sources, if somebody were to somehow look at what you were sending and receiving across one unit, they'd only see a quarter of it. They wouldn't see your whole. So the packet of information gets divided up yes. between the different sources of, yes. of, well, the reception all comes in, but on, on dissemination of the yes. signal, it gets broken up between yes. the different sources and therefore they're only getting a portion of it if they were to be able to hack right. one of them. The likelihood of them being able to hack the entirety of your distribution network for signal would be next to impossible. It would be pretty tough. Yeah. It'd be four times harder than yeah, one, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> See how I did that math? Yeah, that was good. All right. So we've got the exterior components, which are smaller than the old satellite dishes. Yes. Um, in fact, there's... Uh, it's really a flat panel yes. for the, the Starlink. Yeah, um, no longer a dome. Okay. They're flat panels. Um, they definitely don't look yachting to me, but we've... So uh, we hide them. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> so we put them inside empty domes before. It's worked fine, hasn't degraded performance. They have new ones now that mount flat, and they got some shims that you can put on them, and we've painted them so they match You know everything on the mast, and you don't even notice It them. becomes a lot more yeah. invisible. Yeah, you don't see it. So that's going to clean the lines up of the boat of not yeah. having to have that satellite dome on there anymore. Yes. Although you will still have the dome for the Viacom system. Is that a smaller dome than the older ones that we were used to seeing? It's about the same size. Okay. It's uh, the smallest one is a 65 centimeter dome. Okay. Um, but the the difference there is that it's a different quality of, of service, where the the Starlink is a direct to consumer 
consumer type service where the Viasat is more of an enterprise grade um, and there's things about it that make it better than Starlink and there's things about Starlink that make it better than Viasat but they both have a very solid place in yachting. So um, like for example with Starlink the only way to get more bandwidth is to launch more satellites and they're launching them about 52 a week. Mm -hmm. With Viasat, they're able to adjust the spot beams on that satellite to provide more coverage in a geographic area that might have a lot of users in the same place. Like, for example, if you were in Staniel Key for uh, Christmas or New Year's or maybe in St. Bart's, everybody was complaining about Starlink. whether it's 50 feet or 50 meters. Right. right? Okay. Everybody was complaining about Starlink because regardless of the service that they had, they were getting no speed just because the whole system was overloaded. Everybody was soaking it all up. The boats that we had with Viasat that were in those areas was no problem. Viasat was able to adjust their beams and, and bandwidth and provide you know, more bandwidth to that area. Right, because okay. there was more boats there. Okay. More, or more clients with the Viasat system. So, that, so that they both have good and bad things to them, and they're both sure. fantastic, um, but they're both night and day ahead of where we were even three years ago. So the solution sounds quite simple uh, for a larger boat. You yeah. know, you 30 meter boat, 50 meter, 100 meter boat, you've got a lot of real estate, you've got a lot of places that you can put all this stuff. Talk to me about the 35, 45, 65 foot boat. Do we have the ability to put all this stuff in a boat like that? Is it cost effective to be able to do that? Is the guy who owns that 55 footer that wants to go to the Abacos going to see the value in a system like this and does it is it the game changer that he's been looking for to be able to stay in communication and entertain his family yeah so it all comes down to how much internet do you need and everybody I talk to that just got their boat and for the first time is trying to set it up they all say oh, I don't use much internet uh, what do I need that for because I never had it before <laughs> And two months later, they're like, okay, let's go with the unlimited package because right. I need a lot. I didn't realize how much the kids use when they go gaming. Sure. But what happens is the, the better your connection is, the longer that family can stay in a remote area and owner can still do business, the captain can still do his business. You know, everybody's able to, the kids can stream their movies, they can play games. So as much as everybody wants to think they don't use much of it. Well, you don't use much of it because at home and at the office, it's just there. It's, We're on the boat, it, it's not. It's interesting, we, we think about, oh, I wanna get away from all of that. That's my idea of a vacation. I wanna go turn off. Yeah. But the reality of it is, we turn a different direction is what we do. Yes. We don't turn off. We turn to a different manner of connecting and communicating when we are away from the office. Even at family time, you know, in this day and age, the average family is sitting around the room. They all be maybe in the same room, but they're on four different iPads. Yes. You know, yes. And, they, and maybe they're WhatsApping each other when they're in the same room, right? Uh-huh. But the fact of the matter is we become reliant, dependent, and accustomed to a great level of communication yes. and connectivity. So we can have a solution that's applicable to the big boat. We can have an application for the smaller boat as well depending upon how much you want is how much you have to invest. I noticed on one of the screens behind me, you have the ability to see who of your subscribers are online, where, and it isn't, uh, it isn't a, 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 an ability to, to peak, it's really the ability to monitor what's going on and make sure that if somebody has a problem, you can reach in and help them. Yes. So that's on our screen behind us. And what that does is indicates where the boats are. Yes. And give me a little sense of what are we looking at when we look at, um, let's just pick the Abacos, for example. You've got a couple of boats that look like they're active in the Abacos. Yep. Mm -hmm. And does it tell you if the system is down or does someone have to call you and say, hey, my system's down, but then you can dial into it? it by looking at this, I can tell if it's up or down. Okay. But usually we're not... But, you know, there's like 400 of them on that screen. So usually we're not paying attention to it. Usually right. when there's a problem, the customer calls and says, hey, something's wrong. And generally when that happens is it's because they went from the U.S. to the Bahamas and they need to do some tweaks to their SIM cards to get the right card online in their device. Okay. Or they're south of the Bahamas and as you go from country to country, even though it's the same provider like Digicel, 
you still have to tweak the settings every time you go well, to they, a different they country. They probably have contracts and they have geofencing yes. and they have ways of making yeah. sure that because you signed up in Atlanta, Georgia, doesn't mean you're going to get all the signal and all the uh, connectivity right. that you would in Atlanta when you're in Barbados. Right. It's completely right. different. So, so, I mean, it's it's fantastic that we have that, but in my opinion, when you're traveling through the islands like that, regardless of the size of the boat, in a lot of situations, the cost of the SIM cards in the Caribbean is far more than the cost of Starlink in the Caribbean. So there's going to be times when you're going to say, okay, I'm going to the Caribbean for four months, and I can either spend 3000 a month on SIM cards or 1000 a month on, on Starlink. Well, Starlink's the right choice. So again, technology triumphs because we're able to get faster service, more all-encompassing service at a lower price with smaller equipment. Yes. So as technology advances, it gets better and better and yes. better for us. And with the blender, it gives you the ability to capitalize on whatever signal is available to you, yes. bring any one or all of them in to one place at one time. Yes put it all to one network in the boat, and then it can disseminate out to wherever in the boat we have that network speaking to. Yes, yes, and one more thing that Blender does that you won't really notice. We talked about Starlink's only got 4,000 satellites up there right now, and they're always moving. So there's gonna be times, three or four times a day, when you have a outage, and maybe it lasts 10 seconds. Well, during that 10 seconds, if you're streaming a piece, uh, some entertainment, it doesn't really matter. There's enough buffer there to handle 10 seconds. But if you're on a, a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams call or on a WhatsApp video call, that 10 second outage, you're done. Right. And then you got to wait it till it comes off and back, then you get back and then in. reconnect. Okay. So a lot of people, when they're doing business, you know, and the thing cuts out every 20 minutes for a few seconds, it gets very, very frustrating. So that was the primary reason for the blender was because it will seamlessly switch between your sources so that you don't have that outage. So even though this, one of the Starlinks went down, well, the other one can still see it, and, and the, the Pepwave 5G is still providing. So instead of having three sources, now you only have two, so it slowed down a little, but you didn't lose your connection. So you, you didn't lose your Zoom call or whatever business you were doing. That seamless engagement is what makes uh, makes the ability to cruise viable for people. Yes. It, it enables a guy or a, a woman in, in business to be able to stay connected at their leisure. And if they have frustrations in that connection, they're going to say, no, I'm not doing it. It's not ready. Right. Yet. I can't spend two weeks on the boat. I can only spend five days because after five days, I got to be in touch. I got to be Well, back. this now, you're in touch 24-7, so stay for three weeks instead of two. And it works anywhere on the planet. Yes. Yes, it does. And one of the other things it does it, when you're going through the Caribbean, I don't know if you've ever done it, try to get Netflix to work or Pandora to work or some of the stream, streaming services. When you're outside of the U.S., those don't work anymore. I'm very aware of that because I do a lot of IYBA stuff in Europe and I'll want to look at uh, my Netflix subscription and while I'm in Europe and I go to watch a, a series that I'm in the middle of watching yeah. before I left and I get there and they say, unavailable in your area. So it's really disappointing. So this fixes this solves that. that problem. This solves that problem. So even though you're out of the country, when you're using Blender, your connection to the internet is either Chicago or Atlanta, depending on which server we're on for that boat. So that solves a lot of issues that people are having when they travel. I'm thinking we might need an IYBA test blender. Okay, no problem. <laughs> we'll see how that works in yeah. Monaco in May. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. That's really we interesting. That. So it does solve a lot of problems that people didn't have a solution for before. Yes. Besides seamless connectivity and, and, and continuity, it gives you the ability to uh, mimic being at home yes. for your signal. Yes. So what about speed? Does it give you the same kind of speeds that we're used to at home, or is that where we're going to have to suffer? So here in this office, we have Comcast, the landline, which we don't use anymore. What's a landline? <laughs> exactly. Okay. And it was giving us about 110 down. Um, okay. If you look over here at this speed test that we did a few minutes ago, this got this two ninety six down. Two ninety six down. So that's two Starlinks and two five Gs all bonded together. It gave us two ninety six down. So I can run it again. Now, depending on where the Starlink satellites are in view and how fast, it's going to change every few minutes. But if you'd like, I'll go ahead and press this 
go you press button. it, and I'm going to go ahead and do it from my phone. I'm going to join the blender from my phone and see okay. what it does. So we're at two and change. It's over three. You know, 304. Pretty solid. That's incredible. That's amazing. And, and that's, that's completely wireless. It's, and and it's that's as if we were sitting on the boat in the Abacos or yes. in Antigua or in the Canary Islands. Yep. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incredible. On my cell phone right now, it's basically pegging. And it's still climbing, figuring out how fast the signal is. So the download is 234 yep. on the cell phone. So that's taking two Starlinks and two 5Gs and bonding them all together and spreading the load across four devices. So the television that you're using for the test right there mm -hmm. is hardwired to the network. Yes, it and is. And this is wireless, and still I'm getting 234 up and 21 down. Yes. So it's a seamless, incredibly fast experience. Yes. And, and, and I could even play Tetris. Yes, this. you can play whatever you want. <laughs> and one of the other things that we do with it is like we, we encourage people to make a video call. Call somebody on FaceTime, call somebody on WhatsApp video, mm -hmm. and then while they're in the middle of the call, I can turn some of these devices off and you'll see the call does not drop. It doesn't drop out. The call does not drop. So we encourage anybody who wants to come by and do a demo, come check it out, bring your laptop, do a Zoom call, sit here and play with it. Well, I recommend to the brokerage community that they come and talk to you about it so that they can disseminate and share that information yes. with their clients. Yeah. Because this is what's valuable about Yacht Engineering Week is being able to train the brokerage community into the products that the brokers just don't have time to learn about during the boat shows, and there's no substitute for hands-on. Yes. So, yeah, definitely I'd encourage them to come on by. Mike, I really appreciate you taking the time, Michael, I'm sorry, ha to take the time and uh, explain to us what's going on in the communications and connectivity world today. Um, the next segment that we're going to do today is what do we do with the signal once we get it in the boat. Thanks very much for joining no us. No problem. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thanks for coming by. Right. And that's a wrap for today. Yacht Engineering Week 2023 has been brought to you by our title sponsor, Pantropic Power, the local cat dealer. And our anchor sponsor, Robert Allen Law, the business of yachts. We would also like to thank our segment sponsors, Lurson, Viking Marine Exhaust, Zemos, Marine Data Solutions, MPI, Bradford Marine, Ditech, Lewis Marine Supply, MPT, Tropic Ocean Airways, Wards Marine Electric, Seabot, Aquabanas. We'll see you again tomorrow, 9.30 sharp.